Hey, welcome to this special coaching video. My name is Ian. I'm the founder here at EssentialTennis.com, where it's my mission to bring passionate instruction to passionate players just like you. Uh, today, we've got a lot of awesome topics to get to. Let's go ahead and take a look at what those are. Uh, first, we'll be talking about what level should you get special tennis gear. We'll be looking at exactly what that is in uh, just a second. We'll also look at how to have good intensity during matches. If you happen to be or you tend to be a little bit low in intensity during matches, then you'll definitely want to check that out. We'll talk about how to dynamically recover after shots when you're running back and forth during a tennis point. We're going to talk about how to hit aggressive volleys and put shots away up at the net. And we're also going to talk about how to close out points without blowing it. More so about kind of mental toughness than the actual like technique of how to put the ball away. But how do you keep from, from blowing that final shot when you have the point? you know, kind of perfectly set up. So those are all the topics we're going to be getting to today. Let's go ahead and get to our first one. So Jay Look wrote in and said, what NTRP rating do you need to tailor the strings and racket size or shape to one's individuality? And when do you need to get a second racket? Same question for tennis tennis specialist attire. Okay, so we're going to talk about all those different things. So first of all, Let's talk about optimizing racket strings, like the core stuff that you have available to you to actually hit the ball. So any level, any like whatever, UTR, NTRP, you should be doing that immediately as you enter the game. So even if you're a total beginner player, you should find a racket that feels really solid and confident and comfortable to you. Same thing with strings. And this really comes down to personal preference. You need to know for yourself, all of these different things. So this isn't just like an example list. Like you literally need to know for each of these things, what do you personally prefer? The racket frame weight, the racket head size, the balance of the racket where most of the, the weight is, the stiffness or flexibility of the racket, the string pattern, a more open string pattern or a more closed string pattern, the grip size, and then switching over to uh, string, string material, uh, polyester, or uh, Kevlar <laughs> just popped in my head. Like ba back in college, I used to love Kevlar strings in the mains. I put synthetic uh, gut in the crosses, natural gut. How about gauge? How thick or thin the, the tennis string is? What tension? What shape? There's a lot of strings now that have different shapes, square or polygon or like star shape or, or round. You need to know your preference on all these things. And there's only one way to know. I think a lot of times players just assume that, oh, the manufacturer is going to tell me like what's best for me. Listen, at the end of the day, the manufacturer's job is to sell stuff. It's their job to sell as many rackets as humanly possible. It's their job to sell as many sets of string as possible. And so they're going to go about it from a marketing and a sales perspective. And I'm not saying that necessarily like in a negative way or a bad way, but just please know that all communication you you receive from Babolat or from Wilson or from like Diadem, I'm a big fan of, of Diadem. That That's who I happen to use right now for frames and strings. They're trying to sell rackets. They're trying to sell strings. The only way for you to know for sure what all of these different criteria like feel best to you is to try a lot of different stuff and just find out. And you should start doing that from the beginning. As a, a, as a beginner player, you should be doing that already. So second question from Jay, when should you buy a second racket? Well, if you've just got tons of money and you just love tennis and you're just kind of like a, a gear horse and you, you just love like collecting rackets, you love having you know the big fancy player bag with lots of rackets in it, then just go ahead, like go crazy. Go ahead and buy as many rackets as you want. But um, if you don't have a lot of money, then you totally don't need a second racket until you start breaking strings. If you're not actively breaking strings, like on a routine basis, then you just don't need a second racket. Would it be nice? You know, is it convenient to have a second one, even if you don't break strings? For sure. But if you're on like a tight budget at all and you just don't want to spend the money, you're like, ah, I, like I know I'm supposed to have a second racket, but but do I really need one? If you're not a high enough level, you're not swinging fast enough and hitting enough spin to be breaking strings yet, then you totally don't need a second racket. Okay, and then third topic from Jay was, what about tennis specialist attire? 
I've never heard those words put together before. I thought that was kind of a, a funny uh, phrase, but I totally, I totally know what you mean. Like there's all kinds of gear out there that's mar again, like marketed towards tennis players. Uh, whether that be special like fabrics on like shirts and shorts or socks or like all a million different special kinds of tennis shoe that are supposed to be lighter and make you faster and all that sort of thing. So here's all you really need if you want to play your, your best tennis. You need a pair of good tennis shoes, like real tennis shoes. Tennis shoe is kind of a general term, right, for like kind of a sporty athletic type of shoe. Get a real actual pair of tennis shoes and similar to rackets and strings, you have to try a bunch out before you know what feels best to you. On the spectrum, some are really beefy and bulky and heavy and, and very durable and they have a ton of support. And they, if, you're, if you don't like that, then it just kind of feels like a, a tank. Like it feels like you're, you've got bricks, you know, around your feet. Some people totally love that stability and that, that confidence that comes with that feeling. And on the other end is much more flexible, much lighter, much lower to the ground. I'm way over on that end of the spectrum. You totally have to figure out like what feels best for you. And then you need shorts with pockets. <laughs> this used to be like the number one thing that, that we would, uh, back when I was teaching full time at like a normal club, we'd have like junior camps or clinics. Man, when kids showed up without pockets, that was like, we, we, we would like send them home. Like, man, don't come to like tennis camp unless you have shorts with pockets. You have to have shorts with pockets so that you can put the second ball in your pocket when you're serving. It's just necessary. By the way, always put the ball in your non-dominant hand pocket so that you're not reaching like a cross. That's like one of, one of the, the funny kind of beginner things that I see a lot is, is right-handed people will put the ball, the second ball in the right pocket, and then they'll like hit a serve, they miss it, and they have to switch the racket over to the left hand, take the ball out of their right pocket with the right hand, put the ball, and then switch, like switch the ball in the racket. Always put the ball in your, your non-dominant hand uh, pocket. A little, little pro tip for you there. Okay, and now everything else is personal preference. There's lot, tons of nice to haves, right? Like stuff that isn't really super necessary. Like a, a racket, like a nice racket bag is definitely one of those things you totally, in fact, I would say be careful when you play a tournament. Be super careful of the person who walks up to the tournament desk with, uh, I only have one racket here, but they have like three rackets and they don't have a bag. Um, but they, they have, um, the, the handle going through the, the throat of like the other two rackets. And they're just like holding one racket with two other rackets, you know, like kind of strung like through it. And they have a big water jug and like three rackets. Like that's the person you really want to watch out for. There's all kinds of posers, you know, that like they want to get like their, their favorite players, shorts and shirt and shoes and racket bag. And they've got like five rackets, uh, they might not be the same or they might be the same, like whatever. You totally don't need all that stuff to be a really good tennis player. For me personally, I, I love Thorlo socks. I've, I've always been a huge fan of them. I always wear two pairs of socks, uh, a pair of Thorlo's and then like a normal like athletic sock over the top of it to really fill my my shoes like as, as best as possible. And I, I've always really liked Nike tennis, like actual tennis shorts made by, by Nike. I don't know, something about the, the fit, like the pocket is really nice for, for tennis balls. So like those are the things, if I, if I have Nike shorts, I've got socks I like, and I've got the shoes I like, then, then I'm good to go. Like I don't need any other special gear to feel like, okay, I'm ready to play like the best tennis that I can play. So hopefully that all uh, makes sense, uh, Jay. And, uh, and hopefully it's helpful a little bit, gives you a little bit of, of uh, guidance. Definitely feel free to let me know in the comments uh, down below. Um, hey, what's up, everybody in the chat? Hey, Nathan. Uh, Astrian, uh, Lars, regular loser. Sorry to hear that. Uh, Denise, what's up? Good to see you guys here. All right, let's move on to question number two. Oh, is this also, do, I, I've spent like the last two days putting this together and I just realized that both of these questions are from Jay Look. Uh, one like just got submitted and the other one was like from three weeks ago. So um, 
sorry, everybody else, that I, I didn't answer your question this week. I, I totally, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done this on, on purpose. So sorry about that. <laughs> Jay, look, man, it's, it's, it's your lucky day. This question comes to us from Jay. Look, how do you ramp up your intensity in matches? I'm too passive and calm during points. Uh, sorry, point to point of not having any urgency. Also, I cannot mentally get myself to play to win and thus take weapons off the table. All I do is play to keep the point going by hitting at the opponent and hope for an opponent to hit the net or out of bounds. Okay, so we're going to talk about all those those little individual pieces. So I like I like to look at intensity as kind of a spectrum. And you might be anywhere on this spectrum. And I'll tell you kind of where I am just as an example. I think I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum as you. On one end, there's like bouncing up and down, like heart rate, like super high. Adrenaline is kind of taking over the system. This is like far end of, of the spectrum, like overly activated, like overly intense and just kind of really high energy. And as a result, you kind of tend to overheat everything, kind of spray the ball. This is what tends to happen to me. If you go back over the last year, year and a half and watch my matches, I tend to start off matches like really super hyped up and over activated. My adrenaline's way too high. I'm swinging way too intensely. I'm spraying the ball over the place. And it takes me a couple games to like calm down when I, when I don't do a good job of it. Now, on the other end of the spectrum is kind of, it sounds like what you described, low energy, almost kind of like bored, low intensity movement, being careful, kind of tentative swings and, and just and just being careful hitting the ball back. Both of those extremes are not good for performance. And I'm going to share with you exactly how you can kind of get yourself out of that, that rut. So if you tend to be low energy starting a match, then definitely check out this lesson. You want to activate yourself mentally, physically, and in terms of tactics. And I just recently posted uh, this video. This is this is the thumbnail that you want to look for. It's called "How to Start a Tennis Match Strong," and that's the thumbnail you want to you want to look for when you type that into YouTube. So I, I'm not going to repeat all that, but go check out that lesson, and it'll show you like step by step how to do mental preparation, physical preparation, tactical preparation, so you begin the match much higher, like activation and intensity than it sounds like you currently are. So that's that's step number one. Now, in terms of like your tactics, you say that I, you're just kind of hitting the ball back, like waiting them for them to make a mistake. Now, I just want to be really clear up front, like that's really smart. Most tennis points end with somebody making a mistake or making an error of some kind. So especially from beginner to intermediate levels of play, you'll win a ton of matches just getting the ball back and just being like, here you go. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And just using your patience and using your calmness and waiting for an, for an error from your opponent at first is going to lead to a ton of wins on the tennis court. But eventually, you do need confident swings to beat better opponents. As the competition gets better and better and your opponents have more and more weapons at their disposal, then they'll be able to take your safe shots and easily start to put them away. If you're not at that level yet, then totally don't worry about it. You don't need to beat yourself up over the fact that you're playing smart, consistent tennis. That's totally fine. But eventually, you will need to develop swing speed and offense and weapons. And uh, in my book called Essential Tennis, really creative title, there's a chapter, chapter 22, and I'll tell you the drill that's in the, the book. Uh, the, ch that, the name of that chapter is the Great Swing Speed Conundrum. And it talks about how players tend to decelerate and swing slowly in matches. And so here's the, the drill in that chapter of my book that I highly recommend you go out and train and do. And do this on a regular basis. So first, just kind of generally warm up. If, if you can get a ball machine, that would be fantastic. Or you can just drop the ball to yourself. You, you don't even need a hitting partner. In fact, I would recommend not doing this with a hitting partner. You'll see why in a second. Um, you could pay for a lesson with a coach and do this with a coach. Or you could do it with a ball machine. Or you can drop the ball to yourself. So just get a general warm-up and get a nice, comfortable, easy, like 5 out of 10 swing for you. 5 out of 10 means it's halfway up the power scale. So if 10 out of 10 is as fast as you can physically swing the racket and one out of 10 is as slow as you can 
physically move your body and still hit the ball, five out of 10 is halfway up that scale. So start off at five out of 10 and then spend like 30 seconds or 45 seconds making your way up the spectrum. So begin at four out of 10. So drop down a little bit less than half speed. And for like 30 or 45 seconds or so, just hit four hands at that speed and just kind of take some mental notes. Then spend 30 or 45 seconds hitting four hands at a six out of 10 speed, then at, a, at an eight out of 10 speed, and then finally a 10 out of 10 speed. So the goal here is to learn a, co a couple of things about yourself. Number one, which speed feels the most confident to you right now, like as of right now, four, six, eight, or 10? Everybody has a little bit different like tennis personality and uh, tempo or speed of swing that feels most solid and most comfortable, most confident to them. Because of what you described, Jay, like you might be most comfortable at a four, but as you play better and better opponents, it, it's going to be tough for you to beat those strong opponents who start to have weapons. And the other thing you want to be most kind of co cognizant of as you do this training drill is which speed is most consistent. Now it, it's, temp, it's like tempting or like it might seem obvious on the surface like, oh, well, four is going to be the most consistent because it's the slowest. Well, not always. A lot of times when people are most, let's say as an example, let's say Jay goes out and he discovers that he's most confident at six, that might be his most consistent speed. But if he goes up to eight out of 10, then all of a sudden stuff starts to fall down and he starts to make more mistakes. 10 out of 10, you're almost certainly not going to be most consistent. Like when you're hitting the ball as hard as possible, you're 100% not going to be your most consistent at, at 10 out of 10. But the goal here of the drill is to get the answers to these two questions. Where are you most comfortable right now? And where are you most consistent right now? And long term, over time, it's your goal to increase your standard number. So as of right now, Jay, maybe four is your best number. Well, if six months from now, you can increase that to a five, that would be a huge win for your game. And if six months after that, you can swing at a six out of 10 of your max effort and be super solid, confident, and consistent, that would be incredible for your tennis. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to hit every shot at a six, but just to have some wiggle room and some room to play in terms of your intensity and your swing speed, it would really help your game tremendously to be able to do that. So uh, Jay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Chris, see the uh, super chat, really appreciate that uh, very much. Thanks for your support. Uh, Tennis with Andy, uh, reviewing regular diadem elevate soon. Uh, think about getting the regular elevate instead of the tour. Yeah, I um, and customizing. I'm not a big like gearhead. Like I'm not big on customization. I, frankly, that probably would be the best for me because there's times where I feel like the tour is just a just a tiny, tiny bit hard for me to swing. I'm not, I'm obviously not like a big, strong, you know, <laughs> athlete or uh, person. So frankly, for most of my tennis, the regular elevates probably a better choice. But for the net and for volleys, the tour feels so solid. Like the tour is exactly what I love around the net. And uh, I'm a better net player than I am a baseline player. So that's why I ended up going with, with the tour ultimately. Okay. I'm going to take a quick drink and then we'll go to uh, question three. This is what we're, we're going to be talking about. And we'll be looking at a bunch of video examples to discuss how best to recover uh, after getting like stressed or pressured by a good tennis shot. Thanks for hanging out today. I uh, really appreciate having all of you guys here. All right, let's get down to business. From PRKD, how to prevent recoil effect? I wasn't sure what he meant by this, but I'm pretty sure I'm following as I read the rest of the question. Hitting a strong shot sometimes affects stability and recovery takes a couple of seconds. How can you stand strong and be ready for the next shot? So I'm pretty sure what PRK is talking about is like your opponent stresses you or stretches you, they hit a solid shot like to a corner and you're having to run to hit a forehand or run to hit a backhand. 
And a lot of times it takes a little bit of time to bounce back and be ready for the next shot when you've been stressed. And a lot of tennis players are super clunky getting back to a good position after getting stressed. I'm gonna show you an example of that in just a second. There's a huge contrast between what most tennis players do and what the pros do. We're gonna look at the pros as, as well in just a second. The pros build in recovery into their swing so that they save as much time as possible. And uh, PRK, you say like it takes a couple of seconds. I know that like you probably don't literally mean a couple seconds, but even a quarter of a second of time wasted is huge. It only takes about a second and a half or two seconds for an average tennis rally, like for normal tennis players to go back and forth. So obviously if it takes you a couple seconds to recover, then it's, it's just like, it's too late. Like the ball has already gone past you. If you burn a quarter of a second trying to get back to the middle, then the chances of hitting a good shot on the next ball go way down. And if it takes you a quarter of a second to recover from that shot, then the chances of you hitting a good shot on the next ball go down even further. And there's this negative kind of snowball effect that happens. Anybody ever feel that on the court where it feels like every ball just is harder and harder and harder? Well, it's probably because of your recovery footwork. So let's look at an example here of, this is somebody that I just worked with recently in uh, Hawaii. And I'm gonna go ahead and play this first. What you're about to see is this player receiving a forehand out to the side. And I'll go ahead and play this in full speed first so you get a feel for it. And then we'll break it down in slow motion so you can see what's happening. So this player moves out, gets the forehand, starts to recover. And I want you to watch the footwork pattern here. So after, upon hitting the shot and going through their follow through, what we're gonna do is count the number of steps it takes before this player starts getting back towards the center of the court. So here's the follow through. And now left foot is stepping down. So that's step number one. And then after that, left foot comes down. Sorry, let me back up here. So there's the hit, here's step one. There's step two. Here's step three to kind of gather balance and momentum. Then pushing off. Step four, finally starting to get back to the middle again. And now we have recovery underway. And so those extra couple of steps are just absolutely devastating to somebody's ability to feel confident and to feel balanced moving back and forth, moving out to a forehand and then recovering back to the middle again. If you're, con if you're consistently adding two, three or four extra steps to get back to the middle, then it's just incredibly difficult to be effective on the court. So let's look at a case study now of Alcaraz. Uh, Alcaraz is over on the other side of the courts. He's playing some points here against Nadal. And I'm gonna play the first couple of shots of this point, and then I'm gonna zoom in and show you what's happening with his feet. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at how he dynamically recovers instead of running through his shots. So there's gonna be a serve, a return, one or two other shots. And then we're gonna zoom in and look at a couple individual shots. So, that, so this is that same point in the point. So he's gonna move out to his left for a backhand here. And I want you to look at how he sets up with his back foot planted and he's stepping in. This is kind of what every tennis coach like tells you you should do is like step into the ball, transfer your, uh, your body weight, and then do the best you can to move through the shot. And so on this particular shot, what he's doing is he's planting on his front foot, hitting, and I want you to watch what happens to his back foot. As part of his follow through, his back foot swings around, he plants on that back foot, and then he pushes and starts to recover. So seamlessly, he's taken his follow through, set himself up on purpose so that his momentum of this shot can swing his back foot around bring it out to the outside, and then he's seamlessly and dynamically planting and pushing back to the middle. So he, compared to the amateur example we looked at a second ago, he's saving himself four steps. And that's massive, especially when you're playing somebody like Nadal. Okay, let's move to the, uh, the next shot. So on this shot, he gets a little bit caught. He's moving back on this shot, and he's hitting after planting on his outside foot. So he's a right-handed player hitting a forehand and his right foot is planting and he's moving back through the shot 
And watch how his left foot never really touches. He just kind of floats. And so he lands with his right foot on the outside. And now he's immediately planting and pushing off of that outside foot so that he can move his way back towards the center again. So he seamlessly coordinated his swing and his follow through and planted his outside foot so that he could be ready to recover back to the middle again. Let's look at a couple more examples. So we, we saw on the first example, him stepping in. On this one, he was falling back. And now on this shot, he gets stressed out to the side. And again, he's planting on his front foot, but this time, instead of stepping into the court, he is stepping sideways. And so all his momentum is going sideways. But you'll see him purposefully and consciously again hit and rotate and pivot. This time it's done like super crazy athletically. He actually leaves the ground and he's doing this on purpose so that he can plant on that outside foot and watch how he seamlessly and dynamically pushes back. So even though he got put on a dead run on this shot and he had no ability at all to step into the court and he ran sideways all the way across the court, he still found a way to shift his stance, plant on his outside foot, push, and then recover without any extra steps at all. That's unbelievably dynamic and athletic and it saves so much time and he's able to cover so much more courts. Now I've got at least uh, one or two other examples here. Let me show you. It's just really cool how in one point, so we've already seen three different patterns moving in different directions, using different feet for different shots. Let's look at, I think there's just one or two other shots here. So on this one, we've got a neck cord and he gets a little bit like stuck. He has to stop his momentum, get set up. And again, now he's hitting off his right foot for a forehand and he lands on his right foot. And so he finishes basically in a ready position. He's immediately ready for the next shot. And now on this shot, he ends up getting stretched out wide. And instead of stepping on his front foot, now he's stepping on his back foot or his outside foot. So he's going to hit this backhand. Sorry, Nadal's in the way here. Get out of the way, Rafa. So he's going to hit this backhand off his left foot instead of his right, finish the swing, and then catch his momentum. And he's actively sliding after he finishes this shot out to the side and seamlessly, again, catches his momentum so that he can push back in the middle. So we just saw four different patterns from Alcaraz, depending on if he could transfer forwards or he was getting slightly stressed out to the side on his left, or he was getting slightly stressed back to his right, or he was getting like mega stressed out to his left on the backhand side. He used four different patterns. There's four different ways. Sometimes he stepped forwards onto his front foot. Other times he stepped sideways onto his front foot. We saw him step back on his outside foot for a forehand, and we saw him like basically jump and slide to the left on his outside foot for a backhand. Four different situations, four different responses, and in each of those four responses, he took zero extra steps. So the pros obviously are like ridiculous athletes, and they've been training this since they were kids on purpose, and these different ways of doing it are some are things that you should be training at home as well. So if you want to be the best tennis player possible, you need to balance and finish your swing seamlessly using both feet on both sides. Meaning for forehands, you need to get comfortable finishing with your right foot leading and your left foot leading. If you're a right-handed player and your left foot is leading, then you need to train finishing your swing with a follow through that brings your right foot around seamlessly, like what we saw on, on Alcaraz's backhand. Uh, for his backhand, he was leading with his right foot and then seamlessly pivoting and turning his body so his left foot could come around and then immediately start pushing him back towards the other side of the court. But that's not good enough. If you wanna play against the best players in the world or the best players at your local courts, you also need to be able to use your outside foot. So for a righty, that means hitting and planting on your left foot for a backhand and your right foot for a forehand, AKA using an, an open stance. If you can't seamlessly use a square stance and a closed stance and an open stance, 
and in each of those situations, seamlessly rotate yourself or gather yourself dynamically so you can push back smoothly without taking extra steps in the middle, you're just gonna have a hard time covering the court as effectively as possible. So pick the one, like in real life, what you need to do is pick the one that fits the situation the best. And at first, it's just a matter of like just learning them, period. And if you'd like to see a, like a lesson of me on the court actually showing how to train this, then let me know in the, the comments down below. But this is like what to do. And I'd be happy to do like a how to in, in terms of like the actual training progressions in the future. But this is the way it's done. And this is how you can move smoothly, even when you're challenged and recover without taking extra time. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me uh, grab a quick drink and we'll go to uh, question three. Also, if you have not already gone to tennissecret.com, I'm putting together a new, it'll probably be like a 30 or 45 minute training session on this focus topic, how to win twice as many matches with half the amount of running. It all has to do with positioning and targets on the courts. And if, if you can be really strategic and intelligent, about where you aim and where you position yourself, then you can dramatically cut down on the amount of running you have to do. It makes the game way easier for you and it makes it much harder for your opponent. Really smart tennis players, are, are they know how to do this, but most players don't know how and they don't realize they're, that they're actually creating tons of extra work for themselves. So if you'd like to learn how to avoid that, go to tennissecret.com. It's totally, totally free. Um, just have to tell me where to send the training. I'm working on putting it together right now, and it's going to be a live uh, training session that'll be ready probably in the next, probably the, the, the next couple of days, um, by the end of next week at the very latest. So make sure to go check that out. All right, question number three. Uh, I'm sorry, is this number four? Yeah, question number four. This question is all about how to finish points at the nets. I need instructional videos on how to do all kinds of volleys. Videos these days only teach you the basic volley, no punch volleys, I'll put that in air quotes, aggressive ones or put away volleys. I need to learn those to put away points at the net, not just guiding them to areas on the courts. Absolutely, yeah, so we'll cover that right now. We're gonna look at some examples of Roger Federer. He's got fantastic volleys. Bottom line is, is this, a more relaxed hand equals more recoil or bounce back from the racket when the ball hits the strings. The, the more relaxed the hand is, and also the more force is on the ball, the more the racket gets pushed back away from contact when you meet the ball on a volley. And when that happens, less force goes forwards again. So that's what most like consistent volley lessons focus on is like, let's relax, let's be smooth, let's learn how to guide the ball so we can be precise and consistent. So if you wanna do the opposite of that and hit with like maximum power and put the ball away and have the ball travel through the court aggressively, then it's all about hand firmness. Now we want to be really solid with our grip. And when that happens, the racket doesn't get pushed back nearly as far and more energy gets transferred into the ball towards the other side of the court. So either way, your racket should be moving through the point of contact. Like what you, what you don't really see from elite players at the net is like the punch volley. Like uh, for decades, it's been coached to like a phrase I've heard before is squeeze and freeze. Like squeeze part is absolutely correct. But stopping the racket means that there ends up being kind of like a ricochet effect. And when you just stop the racket right at contact, it's very difficult to also have control over where the ball is going. Because when the racket just kind of hits a brick wall, it tends to kind of have a jarring effect of both the racket face and also, as the ball comes in collision with the racket, if you're in the process of just like bouncing off of that, like that punch motion, then it's really hard to have good control over where the ball goes. So let me show you what to do instead of that. And we're gonna use Federer as an example. So this volley right here, it's in slow motion. And I want you to watch how 
his racket gets pushed away from contact on this shot. I'll play this a couple of times. So watch how when the ball hits the racket, the racket actually gets pushed by the ball. So the ball is coming in this direction. And when it comes in and collides with the strings, then the racket actually gets pushed back towards Roger as his racket continues moving down and out towards the other side of the court. And so you can see the face getting pushed back away from the point of contact there. Now, contrast that with this next volley, where he's gonna be much more firm, and this is a shot that he's finishing a rally with on this one. Watch the difference in how the racket face reacts and how the racket head reacts. See how on this one, the racket is just like continuing firmly and it just plows through contact. And so there's no more recoil. The racket's not being pushed away from the point of contact. Instead, I'll go frame by frame here. Instead, the racket keeps moving through the point of contact. It actually does get pushed back a tiny bit, but it's not nearly as much. And so there's much more force. His racket is still moving down and through the point of contact, but because his hand is much firmer and the racket doesn't recoil nearly as much, much more force gets pushed forwards through the point of contact. And so the ball retains much more energy. And so that's the difference between like a guiding, like consistent volley and an aggressive volley. Now, just for fun, watch uh, this next shot and you're gonna see contrast on way on the other end of the spectrum. This is a, a drop volley that Roger hit. So this is as relaxed as physically possible for him. So on this one, his hand is completely relaxed. The ball totally shoves the racket back because he's looking to just drop the ball barely on the other side of the court. So he's trying to take away as much energy as possible. So that's way over on one end of the spectrum, basically as loose and relaxed as possible. All right, here's some full speed examples. And what you're gonna see here is a couple relaxed ones and then a couple firm ones. So there's two kind of rallies where that happens. So these first two shots are relaxed ones. This is where he's just trying to guide the ball back in play. And now that's a firm one. And this is a firm one. So watch that again. Watch how on the first two, the racket gets pushed back as it moves through contact. And now watch on this one, it goes through the ball firmer and that one goes through the ball firmer. And he repeats that pattern. Watch here, how on this one he's soft. You see how the racket gets pushed back? On that one he's soft. And on that one he's really firm. <laughs> you can tell he's not really super happy with that. That's soft, that's soft, and that's really firm. Now, I just, I just the coach in me just can't help but point this out. You notice how he's missing the firm ones? So there's a reason there's a reason why so much time and emphasis is placed on the calm, smooth, like guided ones. I'm not trying to say like Roger's a bad volleyer or like he's doing a bad job here or anything like that. Simply that as you increase the firmness and the tension in your hand and you start sending back a lot more force, your chances of making an error dramatically go up. So you wanna be very picky about when you do firm your hand up. Like you wanna be very picky about when you do squeeze tighter on the racket and you send more energy back to the other side. If you do it on a ball that's not super high and or you're not super close, then your chances of beating yourself and just like spraying the ball and, and missing maybe missing the net, but having it go too far or having it go wide, your chances of those mistakes happening go way, way, way up when you're firm through a volley. So just public service announcement, and here, let me, let me just play this for you one more time, because I, I, I was looking specifically for like a case study like this, and I think this is just a perfect example. So here's each of those again. So two soft ones on these low volleys, where he's relaxing his hand, then a firm one, and then a firm one going through. And then we have a soft one, where his, his racket gets pushed back, soft one, and now a firm one. So he's squeezing his hand tighter on that one, soft one soft one, and then firm one, where he squeezes through it. Now notice on the, the firm ones, he's not, air quotes, punching the ball. Here's that last firm one. He's setting up and he's not stopping at contact. His racket is smoothly going through the ball 
and he, he's still guiding his racket through contact out towards his target. The difference is not necessarily in the size of the movement of the racket, the size of the, in air quotes here, the size of the swing. Like I know everybody knows, everybody says like you're not supposed to swing at your volleys, but good volleyers do have like active motion. They do have a, a path of movement through the ball. So it's not that they're stopping that swing on an aggressive volley. It's just that their hand becomes more firm as they squeeze and go through the ball, which puts more energy on the ball and makes it go through the court that much faster. So train this, and it's all about becoming mindful of different firmnesses with your hand. Go out with a ball machine and practice like from a scale of, of like zero to 10, like two firmness with your hand, and a four, and a six, and an eight, and a 10. Try to keep your movement with the racket the same and see how much further and how much shorter the ball actually travels. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. Hey, B-Man. Yep, this is in fact live. Uh, welcome. So we got one more, uh, one more topic. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the, uh, the topics so far. I'm just going to grab a, a quick drink and then we'll get on to question number five here. Uh, I like this one a lot. I love mental, you know, mental toughness uh, questions. Thanks for hanging out today. Thanks for being here. All right, let's get to this last, uh, this last topic here for today. <clears throat> Justin wrote in and said, how do you close out points? Because I always end up missing that last ball to finish the point. A lot of people feel your pain, Justin. That happens a ton for tennis players. They'll play like an incredible point, scramble, like play defense, get a neutral, get a, a neutral ball to come in and attack, close in towards the net. They get that floating, like sitting ball. It's like, oh, this is it. Like, this is my opportunity. And then after making 10 other shots that were like way harder, you miss that last one. You miss the easy one, right? Okay, let's talk about why that happens. So here's things. Tell me which one like you relate to the most in uh, the comments. Here's things that pop into our heads, and like we, if you're human, this happens. Like you're not a robot. You're not a, a machine. And so we we have fears, we have hopes, we have dreams. And so these are all things that definitely pop into our minds when we're playing tennis and we get that last shot. Like at the most critical moment, how often have you said, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be so pretty. Like it's, this is setting up exactly the way I wanted. Like the picture in my head is coming like true and this is gonna be like the most beautiful shot ever. Or winning, maybe it's like match point and you're saying to yourself, this is gonna be, I'm about to win, this is gonna be incredible right? Or, holy crap, like what if I blow this? Especially on the, on the critical shot, like it's floating in the air, it's slow, you're just standing there, like you're already in the right position, your opponent is like running off to the side, like falling into the side curtain, right? And the pop, the, the thought pops in your, in your head, yikes, like what if, what if I blow this? Or, don't mess it up, like whatever you do, like don't hit this in the net. And of course what happens, you hit it in the net. Or, even more negative, Oh no, like I always miss these shots. Or notice how some of these are positive and some of these are negative. I've never beat Steve before. So some of these are actually positive like statements. Oh, this is gonna this is about to be incredible. This is gonna be such a pretty like winner. And other others of these are negatives. It kind of depends on your psychology, what happens most frequently for you. Is it more like a negative thought or a positive thought? It doesn't really matter. The positive thoughts can be just as destructive to your results on the court. It's not just about having, like just because you have positive thoughts in your mind doesn't mean that you're gonna make these shots. In fact, it takes away from your focus. So here's a, a key principle you need to remember in all sports and frankly, in life. You can only consciously focus on one thing at a time. You cannot consciously process multiple like math problems at once. You can multitask, like huge air quotes here. You can multitask by like hopping back and forth, but you can't actually simultaneously like watch two movies at the same time. You have to choose which one you're actively processing. Now, of course, we have tons of subconscious computing power that's like always solving problems for us in the background. But 
when it comes down to closing out a point or a game or a set or a match in tennis and that final shot comes to our racket, our conscious mind needs to be on something specific. We're going we're to talk about exactly what that is. If you don't train your mind to focus on what matters most, when it matters most, then random stuff will take its place, like all those thoughts that we just talked about. So what you should be asking now is, well, what matters most? We know when it matters most, right? The most critical moments, like we kind of intuitively know, like what, if you play the game for a while, you know, like, well, this is like a do or die time. Like I need this point. So what matters most? There's two things that you should be focusing on as that ball is coming your way and you're like setting up for like the put away volley. Number one, you should be consciously picking a target. This isn't something you want to leave to chance and just like, just hit the ball and hope it goes like in a good spot. Target is thing number one that you should consciously have in mind. It's critical that you make it a specific thing and not a general target. A general target would be cross court is a general target. Well, guess what? If you aim cross court and the ball goes two inches in the alley, well, you, technically you hit your target, right? Like if you have a forehand volley over on the deuce side, you aim cross court to the other deuce side and you hit it in the alley by six inches, congratulations. If you're aiming cross court, you hit your target. It needs to be more precise than that. A general intention is gonna give you general results. Anytime a ball comes your way, you should have a specific result in mind that you're trying to achieve, AKA what specifically am I aiming where on the court, what target am I trying to put this, this shot? The second thing you want to have in mind is the purpose. Like, what is the reason, reasoning behind that target? And so, what is this shot accomplishing? Is it, am I hitting a cross court because the court is open and I just think this is going to be a winner? That would be a good reason to aim for two feet inside the line as a specific target and uh, six feet inside, uh, two feet inside the sideline and six feet inside the baseline. That spot on the court would be a great target to aim for if your opponent is out of position on the other side of the court. It might also be a pattern or maybe a, a weakness, a tactical advantage. Maybe your opponent's backhand is super weak. And so you're trying to put it over to their backhand side just to gain the advantage in a rally by putting it over in that spot. But these two things are what need to be the front of your mind, what you're consciously focusing on. Your target, a specific target, and a purpose or a reason why you're hitting that, that spot in the first place. Now, here's the thing. Here's, here's how you stop like blowing it on the critical shot. The more disciplined you are about focusing on what matters and that it's target and purpose, at the most critical moments, the more you'll start to do it. This is something that you have to kind of exercise. Just because I told you to do this doesn't mean it's easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. And you've heard athletes talk about this all the time. Oh, I'm just taking it one shot at a time. I'm just trying to do the best that I can on each individual play or each individual shot or each individual game. Like even professional athletes are constantly trying to remind themselves and their teammates, let's keep it present focused. Let's keep our minds focused on what's happening right now, right in the here and now. Here's the thing about all of these other things that we say to ourselves. It's not the here and now. So this is about the future. This is about the future. This is about the future. Uh, this is about the past. This is about the past. This is about the future. And so what we're not doing is focusing on the task at hand. And this is why players blow it. It's because they have these thoughts pop up in their mind. It takes over their processing, their conscious like focus. And now the chances of making a mistake are dramatically higher because we don't have a purpose and we don't have a target behind what we're trying to do. And so the concept here is unbelievably simple, but getting good at it takes awareness and it takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of repetition before we become that clutch player that hits like the best shot possible when it really matters the most. So when you start doing this, it becomes a positive cycle. You start to focus on productive things and you start getting winning results. 
And then that just kind of feeds back in a positive feedback loop. And you start having better and better shots and results when it really, really matters the most. Now, with all that being said, just keep in mind, you're still gonna make some mistakes because you are human, you're not a robot that you just program in cross-court volley and you never miss it. But the more narrow and present your focus is, the more successful you're gonna be. You will still make some mistakes and that's totally fine. If you make a mistake and you think back about where your focus was and it was on a good thing, then you can still pat yourself on the back and know that you did the best you could. But when you get that high floater, sitter, you know, volley, and you dump it in the net and you realize, oh man, I was just I was just reminding myself about how I always dump these in the net or like, man, I hope I don't lose to, to Jim or whatever, then that's where you wanna give yourself that little bit of constructive feedback and say, no, you're, you're not focusing on the right thing. No wonder you missed the shot. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching today. I really appreciate you uh, hanging out. Um, if you'd like additional coaching on how you can win twice as many matches with half the running by covering the court better and picking smart targets, making the game way easier for you, way harder for your opponent, then make sure to go to TennisSecret.com. Um, that's all I've got time for today, but big thank you to everybody who was hanging out in the chat. Really appreciate seeing you guys here. Uh, big thank you to Chris for the, the super chat. Really appreciate that very much. Uh, real quick, uh, Chris, if you're still here, muscle my shot sometimes, any tips on grip? Mostly happens on volleys, close to net. Okay, yeah, so the, the lesson I did on the volleys today is exactly what I would recommend. Uh, watch that through if you haven't seen it already. And do some, some practice with a ball machine would be the best, where you're mindful about your grip tension. And just do some experiments. Like, t totally doesn't matter. Like, if you make it, miss it, whatever. But learn how to get more familiar with yourself and your hand and what happens to the ball when your hand is at different firmnesses. Uh, to me, that's like at the foundation of being a really good net player. Uh, Denise, you're welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for hanging out today. Thanks for your support. And I'll talk to you all again really soon. Take care.